fortunate and appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Okay. So let's start um, right away with some breathing meditation. Letting go of whatever happened throughout this week, today. Think that you're in the presence of Buddha Shakyamuni, who appears in that space in front of you, as a fully ordained monk. And as a manifestation of all the enlightened qualities. Wisdom, great love, great compassion. All the qualities we have that potential to achieve. As always, the Buddha has surrounded all the great masters who attained realizations through following and practicing, practicing his teachings. Surrounded by the masters of India, the Nalanda masters and others. surrounded by the great Tibetan masters. All the other realized beings of the past. Just try to get a sense of their, their presence And of course, we are surrounded as always by all sentient beings. Appearing in different shapes. The different personalities. They're all wishing to be happy and not to experience problems and pain. But the nature of their mind and the nature of our own mind being not different to the nature of the mind of the Buddha. And then generate a 
affectionate love towards all sentient beings based on the understanding that there's so much suffering that they experience due to their basic misapprehension of reality. So generate a sense of deep care and affection. Concern for their well-being. While at the same time feeling close to them and being accepting of their shortcoming or shortcomings. And your affectionate love then gives way to great compassion. Which is again a type of affection, which focusing on the suffering of sentient beings wishes every one of them to be free from suffering and its causes. and wishes that I may be able to protect them, may help them to free them from their suffering. To generate that aspiration, may I be able to protect them all their problems, all their pain, and the causes of these unwanted states. And as the aspiration grows stronger, it turns into a type of determination or the altruistic attitude that is determined to work for the welfare of all sentient beings, lead them to, this, to a state free from suffering. no matter how long that will take and how difficult it might be. And then induced by your love, compassion, and concern for all sentient beings, generate the wish to become completely enlightened for the welfare of each and every sentient being. particular thing that studying Chandrakirti is entering into the middle way, may that become a cause for our own enlightenment, for the welfare of all sentient beings.
And then let's deepen out our motivation, strengthen it, strengthen it further through reciting the prayers together. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. In particular, focusing on your love and compassion for all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. And may all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. And then particularly directed at the front visualization that is inseparable from your Lama. Reverently I prostrate with my body speech and mind. I present every type of offering, actual and imagined. <coughs> I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time. and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of sightly existence. And turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of others to the great enlightenment. Okay, thank you. Let's start as always with some questions and there's some questions. Well, there's definitely a question I couldn't answer last time. So I wanna answer that first. That was Jimmy's question. Just need to find it. Um, yes, so Jimmy wrote last time, uh, well, he asked, I have problems con generating compassion for my Buddhist lamas. It seemed that since they're enlightened, I cannot ex they cannot experience any type of suffering. So if they experience, if they manifest any signs of discomfort, agitation, or unease, it is just, well, a kind of show, if you like. I mean, it's just manifesting them. So they're not really suffering. So is that wrong or not? Um, no, I mean, if you perceive your Lama to be a Buddha, I mean, this is a really difficult thing to do, just uh, to put it out there. This is really difficult to do, but if you can manage to do it and really perceive their actions as just manifestations um, for our own benefit, I mean, definitely, like, uh, if they get sick and they have certain problems, um, well, if you perceive them to be a Buddha, a Buddha doesn't have any suffering, doesn't have this suffering and its causes. Now, why would you then um, generate the wish for the Buddha to be free? I mean, that's what's, what 
um, compassion is. It's a affectionate type of mind. So affection, that's different. We can still, of course, have affection uh, for our Lama. I mean, we should have affection towards a uh, feeling of closeness and so forth towards our Lama, but we don't need to um, have the wish for them to be free from suffering. And here, suffering doesn't just refer to the suffering of suffering and, and so forth, the three types of suffering. Oh, I just remember, I usually don't start with a question. I start with uh, talking about what to do next week. I'll do it after I've answered some questions. Sorry for that. Anyway, going back to Jimmy's question. Yes, yeah, so it's um, not necessary. And even if you don't perceive your Lama as a Buddha, well, being more highly advanced, that Lama being, I mean, usually, I mean, a, a qualified Lama is someone who's definitely got greater qualities than we have at the very least and you know possibly being on the path to enlightenment uh, in that case should we have compassion yeah i mean definitely the wish for them to be free if they still have shortcomings etc to be free from them from these shortcomings um even the wish may i be able to protect them hmm. uh, like in the case of great compassion so it's not just the wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering, so all sentient beings, including our Lama, in case we don't see them as a, as a realized, or sorry, as an enlightened person. Um, so perceiving the Lama, wishing that for the Lama, but also may I be able to protect them from that? That kind of seems like, well, it should be, shouldn't it be the other way around? Um, but of course, in the way your compassion, if, if you generate great compassion, it would be incomplete unless you were to include your Lama, like even not knowing is the Lama a Buddha or not. So just in case the Lama is a Buddha, is not a Buddha. Um, and so in case for some reason I'll be able to protect them from their suffering, well, may I be able to do that? Um, that would be a possibility. But the point is really... Um, yeah, well, if we, if we cannot, in the sense like if we see the Lama as a Buddha, then that's not a problem. And uh, otherwise, well, it should, the Lama should be included, but we don't have to focus so much on the Lama as such. I mean, just as a sentient being, if we perceive anyone like being a sentient being, having shortcomings, therefore, by nature, I mean, that's just the nature of a sentient being to still wish anyone so who, no matter who they are to be free from that and then that feeling of closeness and yeah it's not like it's not really like taking the llama out of it and specifically focusing on the llama in that sense and i guess then it's a little easier but yeah anyway I, i've kind of answered at least the part of your question when you said if you perceive the llama as a buddha then of course the buddha doesn't have suffering or any shortcoming for that matter Okay, that was his first question. And then uh, his second question, just a sec, I need to just go back and forth a little bit. Um, so, oh, he says, well, from what he's learned so far, one thing seems obvious that whatever I happen to experience has something to do with my mind. Yes, I would agree. Um, so, Everything is therefore labeled by the mind. And that makes sense. I'm just summarizing a little bit in case of ordinary objects. Uh, he says he can relate to that. But my Buddhist Lama, since in particular with regard to uh, enlightened teachers, so perceiving them as enlightened teachers, if they were enlightened, which is a possibility. Um, so perceiving the Lama as having all these positive qualities, ideally, and uh, seeing this and, you know, not seeing them as having any negative qualities. If we have that pure vision of the Lama, seeing them as a Buddha, how can my own mind being full of afflictions, such as self-grasping attachment and so forth, how can such a mind label the mind of a Buddha? How's that? How could the Buddha or how can the Buddha can be labeled by um, a, a mind like our own personal ordinary mind. Well, it is still labeled, but it's not like, well, a Buddha's mind being labeled as a conventional truth doesn't mean it has to be labeled by our mind, that our mind uh, labels the Buddha for one, matter, for, for one thing correctly. I mean, when we talk about labeling, 
there's correct labeling and there's incorrect labeling. And when we say just in general, everything is labeled, we're focusing on the correct labeling, but we're not specifying who exactly uh, labels correctly. I mean, a lot of the things we label, we don't label correctly. We get a lot of it right, but a lot of things we don't get right. In particular, when it comes to beings of with very high realizations that we just don't um, grasp really and may misapprehend. That's possible, of course. And then our conceptual mind, our, our thoughts, they don't label correctly. We may get some correct and some not. Um, so therefore saying, well, the Buddha is merely labeled, then is, are there minds that label the Buddha correctly or the Lama for that matter? And yeah, we should think, of course, of all the great beings on the path, like Bodhisattvas on, on very advanced levels. I mean, um, they have a kind of uh, higher perception. They perceive, well, sentient beings that may not be in front of them. They, they let's say, perceive our own Lama, who's like this highly realized being, and uh, label this Lama in, in the correct way. So anyway, uh, that, that's it's not a problem. And we're also not saying, um, well, unless I, I label the Lama can't exist. Of course, there's more to the Lama being merely labeled. Um, yeah, anyway, so hopefully I've, I've explained that to some degree. Yes, our mind is limited and we don't, we're not able to fully recognize all the qualities of the Lama and therefore uh, so our labeling of the person is at best just limited and at worst called completely wrong. Um, yet there are other beings, of course, highly advanced beings, and we're going through the different stages and it's difficult to really grasp the qualities of a, let's say, 10th ground bodhisattva. Uh, but one sense we can get, there's definitely a very uh, uh, correct or, or a thorough understanding of what a Buddha is. I mean, of course, the Buddha has the best understanding of a Buddha, but just one step beneath that or below that would be the understanding of a 10th ground bodhisattva and their minds to label. So there you go. It's labeled by those minds. Okay. Um, yes. And so whatever your understanding is, maybe you misperceive the Lama. Oh, right. That's, that's not, I mean, unless it creates many problems because you mis your misperception is, is so, uh, I don't know, disturbing, or, but, but, but how would that happen? I mean, if you, if it's completely wrong, yeah, of course it may cause trouble, but it doesn't have to be. So even if we don't perceive the Lama in, with all his or her qualities, let's say it's a really highly advanced person, well, then that's okay. We take what we can or we uh, perceive them in the way we can. Okay, that's, that was Jimmy's question. I won't have time to do Tau Cities today, but I will, address his question next time he'd be the first one i'll answer and then there's one question from leora leora talked about um, the two types of meditative absorptions um, on the path of seeing on the path of meditation they arise actually on both levels or both uh, path so one which eliminates uh, which eliminates um, certain obstructions and one that doesn't so what's the difference, really? What is the cause for them? So I, I guess the cause of the two minds really means why do you have one and not others? I mean, why, right? I mean, Leora, why do you sometimes have a mind that doesn't eliminate obscurations and others can do that? What's the difference between those two minds? Well, um, well, some uh, masters in the past uh, have, for instance, said that before you generate a mind um, that is able, a meditative absorption. So you enter into meditative absorption. Um, and before that meditative absorption is able to actually start to eliminate any type of obscurations, coarser or settler types, there is a moment when it's kind of like, I don't know, it's maybe like the, the past when before you could drive a car, you had to run run a little bit to be able to to be fully functioning i don't know um it could be that that especially in the beginning the mind doesn't have that power yet so maybe you just need a few moments to just focus um, on emptiness directly experience emptiness and then that mind starts as an uninterrupted path so it seems to suggest that 
the uninterrupted path, some of the explanations given by masters of the past seem to suggest an uninterrupted path is first preceded by this um, non, non-eliminating uninterrupted path, and then it starts, it starts to eliminate something. So we distinguish between those two. And yeah, the reason being, it doesn't have that strength in that moment yet, but before long, that strength will be there and it will start doing, um, eliminate um, in, in certain obscurations. And so if you ask, for instance, well, what is its strength? I mean, what is the strength? Well, there's not much more to say than the strength in terms of being able to eliminate an obscuration or not. I'm thinking of like, what is the strength? Like, how do you determine the strength of a of a wind, like a, a wind, like a gust of wind or, or I don't know, a, a, a hurricane? Well, at the speed at which it it moves or at the power it has to lift things up or what have you. So similarly here, how do you distinguish between these two? Well, having that strength or having not having that strength. Um, there are definitely the different types of absorptions in that some have the strength to eliminate coarser types of obturations, but not subtler types. So there's that distinction. I mean, just look at the uh, absorptions that arise on the path of seeing. They can, of course, eliminate certain obscurations, the um, intellectually acquired ones, but not the innate ones. They don't have the strength to do that. If they had that strength, you'd only have to uh, enter one of meditative absorptions and they were all gone simultaneously. But the reason we have to enter one and exit again and enter again and exit again is because the mind doesn't have the strength. And it's also natural that we may enter such an absorption, but there are types of absorptions that don't yet have that strength. And then through prolonged, uh, well, direct realization of emptiness, then within that same continuum as part of the same meditative session that may turn into a meditative absorption that actually now eliminates uh, obscurations or you may even have to arise from it again accumulate more merit and then enter once again before the mind has that capacity because there's so many causes and conditions that enable the mind that realizes emptiness directly to eliminate certain obscurations. I mean, the merit we accumulate, the the strength of the mind determined by our motivation and so forth, all that plays a part. So I would say, yeah, it's just kind of a different type of ability that a direct experience comes with. All right, great. Those are the questions. And now uh, to say a little bit about what I would like you to do for this coming week. You may have noticed, of course, uh, although bodhicitta is uh, what we mainly focus on, generating the mind of enlightenment again and again and again, but then in connection or conjoined with uh, wisdom, and here the wisdom is the wisdom um, kind of perceiving, focusing on one of the four seals, now, the four axioms, as they're sometimes called, or to translate a Tibetan term, the, the seals, uh, the philosophical seals of, of Buddhism. So the four seals are all uh, conditioned phenomena are impermanent. So I've asked you to reflect on the impermanence of, well, mainly sentient beings, uh, your own impermanence, the environment, and then alternate that understanding with bodhicitta and kind of alternate between those two minds and in that way conjoin them so that your bodhicitta influences your understanding of um, impermanence and impermanence or assists your understanding of impermanence and your understanding of impermanence assists your bodhicitta um, or influences it in, in a positive way so that's this kind of idea of conjoining they strengthen each other so you've done it for two weeks with Uh, the idea all conditioned phenomena are impermanent. Then for the last two weeks, uh, it was the focus of the wisdom wisdom aspect was on um, all contaminated phenomena on the nature of suffering. Focusing on sentient beings, our own predicament as a being part of samsara and so forth, but mainly sentient beings. So the different types of sufferings that they experience. Now for this week, uh, we'll, we'll address the third axiom, 
which is that all phenomena are empty and selfless. Now, empty and selfless um, means different things. Um, so empty, and there are definitely different interpretations of, of the word empty, but um, one interpretation is that it refers to the fact that a person does not exist as a permanent, heartless, independent entity. It's, a, it's considered to be a coarse type of selflessness that is easier understood than, for instance, the lack of an inherently existent person. So let's start out with that. Of course, eventually we'll go into emptiness. We'll talk of emptiness. We'll, we'll make emptiness our focus. But for now, uh, taking, well, again, uh, in terms of the method aspect, we focus on bodhicitta, all sentient beings, may they be, may I become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings, generate that mind over and over again, but then also uh, become aware, then move away from that, I mean, a different type of mind, then focuses on the fact that these sentient beings lack a permanent, partless, independent self. I myself lack such a self. I want to become enlightened, but this but person who wishes to do so is not permanent, partless, and independent. Now, where does that come from? Many of you are aware that this perception of a person was actually a perception many non-Buddhist philosophers at the time of the Buddha had when they uh, accepted uh, Atman or a kind of a separate entity called the self. Um, Roughly spoke, speaking, you could say like all the different assertions um, that were prevalent at the time in India and many centuries before that and to, and to come uh, was the idea that there is a permanent, partless, independent self. So let's leave out the partless part as such, um, but more the focus on there's no permanent self and there's no independent self. The self is not like a pea in a pot. So the pot is like the aggregates and the person is like the pea. So like the sense that we may not have like innately, but we may intellectually come up with this idea. And it's also, well, possibly parts of certain religions that there's a soul that can totally separate from mind and body. And then, I don't know, uh, go somewhere, etc. Now, that sense we should focus on that just although we intellectually already know that but internalize it so really internalize it get a sense yes there is the person doesn't exist as a permanent entity we had impermanence before yes but we didn't specifically focus only on the person so understanding that a person is not permanent how do we perceive someone let's specify that so how does a misperception of someone being permanent, how does that manifest? Usually it manifests in the way that we perceive an earlier person, a person from yesterday and the person today as being the same. Now you may think, well, no, I, I understand the person yesterday is not the person today. I understand that. Uh, why would I have such a mis misapprehension? Well, we have. We have it all the time. Um, intellectually, of course, we know. We know, oh, the guy yesterday is not the guy today because they've changed and so forth, especially if you study philosophy, you know that. But not all our misapprehensions are these intellectually kind of induced misapprehensions. That many of them that just innately arise and we never even think about that. It doesn't make sense that we perceive this person to be the same person today. So how does that, how does it manifest this innate sense of the person is permanent when you are unforgiving, when you bear a grudge, okay? When you meet someone, okay, you see them today and you think, oh, that's the guy who, who insulted me yesterday. That's him. So that thought, that's the guy who insulted me yesterday. That's, thinking that the guy yesterday and the person today, they're the same. That's the same guy, right? That's the one who insulted me, insulted me last year. So the insult, let's say it was 
you know, a year ago. And we're unforgiving. We, we bear a grudge, grudge. We hold a grudge. We can't let go. And there's a sense that insult is still with this person. This is still the, ins the, the insulting person. That's the same person. So holding a grudge, I think, is a good, a good indication for the sense of that's the same person, this innate sense that's almost, we're not almost not aware of it, or we're probably not aware of it. This innate sense that gives them rise to bearing a grudge, uh, as that example. But of course, also it can lead to certain attachments. Oh, he's the person who's been so kind to me. Like two years ago, we had such a great relationship. And this kind of wish fulfilling thinking, like, oh, if it was just were if it just were the same. So that's still the guy who was so wonderful. But you know, people change. We change, they change. Um but so the point I'm trying to make is we have that sense often that something in the past is the same as it is now. Sometimes we come to a place and say, "Oh, that I was exactly that's the the, the that's exactly the 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 the." the tree that I, I under, that I, I spent a day under I, mean, I, I sat around this tree last year or whatever and again the sense that's the same tree uh, and it kind of feels that way so anyway especially with people there is no such a person there is no if, if you happen to hold a grudge bear a grudge you're lucky <laughs> you can deal with that you know so if anything you still can't let go all right, focus on that person, of course, generating the mind of enlightenment. Maybe our parents, maybe our siblings, those are usually deep rooted, um, the sense of not being able to let go and get a sense, well, that is not the same person. They may do similar things again, but I'm still holding on to this insult. So, therefore, maybe take that as opportunity to let go to forgive, forgive the person. You don't have to forgive the action. It's no problem. You know, you don't have to say, oh, the action was all right, never mind. No, just separate the person from the action. So forgive the person. And of course, based on the understanding, that person who did that is not the person today, however similar they may be. So anyway, I'm sure you find ways to, to deal with it. But the main focus should, of course, be, yes, no permanent, no partless. So really partless in the sense, of course, there's no self that is without the aggregates, like a pea in a pot, right? So therefore, there's no independent self that doesn't have the its parts, which are mind and body. So to specifically focus on that, and that understanding is easy. That is That fact is easier than, of course, the lack of inherent existence. So that should be your focus. For many of you, you may be more familiar with this, the lack of a permanent partless independent self. For others, it may be it's a new idea. I haven't really discussed it. And so, yeah, maybe a little harder. And if you do some research online, you'll find some explanations on this if you, if you need more explanation. All right. So that's, that's uh, for this coming week. And of course, main focus is bodhicitta. And do whatever you can and well according with respect to the explanation i just gave and then let's return to the text okay All right we, we finished the first uh verse the first verse of the 11th chapter right okay you can see the first and there's something i want to say uh, just in that connect in in that um well connected to that or in that in relation to that especially when we did the meditation last time and we went through the qualities of a bodhisattva and i was thinking um well it is really hard to believe that this is even possible considering our own experience Right, I think of your own experience, like in daily life. I mean, like a person living for a hundred eon. How many people do I know that lived until a hundred years? So, who, where, where are the people living after a hundred eon, eons? Right, where are all these incredible qualities? I'm just looking for them um, in my text. So, where are all these incredible qualities? Where is it? Um, 
it says here so on the 10th ground he he the bodhisattva will receive supreme empowerment from all the buddhas okay oh no sorry that's the 10th ground I think 11. on the first ground the bodhisattva sees 100 buddhas yeah i don't know what other people see so no problem with that and knows as well that he's blessed by them all okay um just have that interaction with buddhas of course that's uh really incredible and then being blessed but you know i don't need to be aware of another person having that perception so no problem he endures for a hundred eons now that becomes more difficult but of course we need to also understand that bodhisattvas and this is a little easier in the according to the tantric explanation i guess you could say with different uh pure realms being explained and so that you can exist on a different realm you have an emanation is still present in the human realm but there the, the actual person is uh, existent in uh, other realms in other states of existence and so however complicated that may sound now it explains things a little but even just talking about it on the sutric level um I mean, first of all, a bodhisattva would still is able to manifest in different ways, especially on the first from the first ground onwards. And it doesn't mention like a hundred different manifestations that the a bodhisattva can can emanate. So there are all these different manifestations a bodhisattva can emanate. Um, so here, being able to remain for a hundred years refers to that which emanates these out, these different emanations. But just besides that, it, I think it's really important to spend some time with the fact what we perceive around us is so limited. We have this innate sense, oh yeah, this is all there is. If something exists, scientists know, know, know it, which of course most scientists will say that they know everything but we have this kind of sense oh can't exist because scientists don't talk about it um and i think in relation to that also that bodhisattvas don't necessarily even if they were part of this world at some point exist in this world right now and i'm not talking about different realms i'm talking about the fact that there are so many world systems trillions of world systems billions whatever world systems that are similar to ours and i think this is where science comes in science can be helpful um just to get a bit of a sense our world it's just a tiny 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 place um there's so much more in the universe so for instance um we live in a galaxy called the Milky Way, and I looked this up, so I, I, I don't I don't didn't know these things before I looked them up today. So our sun is just one hundred, it's one of hundreds of billions of stars, which are swirling around in the Milky Way galaxy. The, our sun, so our sun is like one of hundreds of billions of stars that is part of the Milky Way galaxy, but. Um, where did I read this? The there's only the Hubble Hubble uh, um, what is it called? The Hubble um, telescope that is able to perceive certain galaxy, a certain amount, and so based on what you can perceive through the Hubble Hubble telescope, scientists can know that there are at least I don't think a, a billion galaxies in our universe if not more, I read somewhere a trillion, but never mind. some say a billion, some say a trillion. And those are just the ones the Hubble telescope can indicate that that is the case. So think how many galaxies there are besides Milky Way, but so billions, trillions of galaxies, but just focusing on the Milky Way galaxy goes on to say, it's a huge collection of stars, dust and gas. And the sun is located on one of the spiral arms. It's kind of called the spiral shape, which is about 25,000 light years away from the center of the galaxy. So if we could move from where the sun is located, where we are, just to the center of the, the, the center of the, the um, 
of that galaxy, the center of the Milky Way. And we're not that far out. There's a picture here, but never mind. You can Google it. So we're not that far out. If we could go to the center, it, it would take us 25,000 light years. I mean, think of the distance. And that's just one tiny galaxy of billions. I mean, it's nothing. Of course, it makes sense. I mean, the Buddha spoke about it. Their world system like ours, with there being a sun, a moon, and the world, and life, trillions of them, all right? And then maybe there are other universes, and we, you know, besides the one universe we live in, maybe in our cosmos, there are endless universes as well. The Buddha talked about endless world systems, and that's usually interpreted not to mean different universes, but rather systems just like ours. So that there's life on other stars, duh. I mean, why should there just be us in that huge, huge cosmos with all these billions of Milky Ways that are just as big and maybe bigger, maybe some smaller than our galaxy. So therefore it gives us a sense, oh, just because it's not there on earth, you know, on planet earth and it can't, and no, no, there's so much more. And intellectually understanding it, of course, is always different to internalizing it. And internalizing all the analysis we do, all the analytical meditations we do, the purpose of that is to move away from that intellectual, well, okay, all right, rather than that, to be affected by it emotionally. Wow, right? This kind of thought, wow, that means we've internalized it. So any kind of analytical meditation should have that wow effect, if you like, that sense of like being emotionally, well, in this case, overwhelmed by the possibilities. And so when we start with that, possibilities, living beings like that, well, those are the ones we could potentially perceive because we have sense faculties that could perceive human beings in other galaxies. And maybe within this galaxy, of course, great possibility. We just can't travel that far yet. So no way to find out yet. But, or maybe we could if we just been traveling in the wrong direction, but never mind. So therefore, the fact that there could be living beings that we can actually so many different of them and some of them you know where there are buddhas walking around there are bodhisattvas with very um very long lives and i mean even we hear in this in the text that there in this world there were living beings who had an extremely long life there will be living beings who have an extremely long life and i mean the question that arises is then well, well what about that that didn't happen because there are only neanderthals and there were dinosaurs but how do we know before the dinosaurs there wasn't something else? I mean, science finds all the time new beings that lived before. And, you know, there's another human kind that lived. I and mean, they find maybe there was a human kind and we don't know how long they lived and et cetera. Anyway, so my point is just, just because we live in this world and we see very few possibilities, there's so many more. Okay. Therefore, when you think of the qualities of a bodhisattva, the way we discuss it here, well, consider these incredible possibilities of just this universe. And then think, well, there's so many things our sense faculties cannot perceive, so different realms. Why shouldn't they exist? Just because we can't see them, they don't exist? Well, science teaches us that that is definitely not a, a, a good way to, uh, to think. I mean, to think of what exists and what doesn't. And sometimes science may know of certain existences and there's a lot that science hasn't discovered yet, may in the future. So different realms of existence, therefore, where they're living beings, they have their own experiences. And I mean, sometimes I remember just in Dharamsala, you know, there are a lot of stray dogs in Dharamsala. And I don't know, I'd be walking home from class and be like talking to someone, we're discussing maybe something that came up or his homeless gave a beautiful teaching. So we just went to the teaching ground and there's this, 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 there are like three or four dogs fighting with one another. And I'm thinking they live in a totally different world. They have no idea, even if they were at the, at the temple when his homeless was there, you know, they didn't hear any of what we heard. That even if they heard his homeless's voice, I have no idea. There they are fighting and tearing each other's ears off and what have you. Um, and so it's almost like we perceive something they don't perceive and they perceive the smell that gets them crazy of another dog, which we don't perceive. And there we are parallel to each other and not aware of each other's worlds really just happen to see them. But 
There could be all these beings around us right there where you are right now. Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, definitely. Uh, but even besides that, just other beings um, of different realms. So to allow that possibilities, that, that possibility and move away from being so fixed in, in our ways. This is like, it's the advantage of the scientific age, but it's also the disadvantage somehow to think, well, if something exists, it should be right there and we should be able to see it. And otherwise it's just made up by some religious fanatic or what have you. Of course, some things are made up by religious fanatics, but this actually makes sense. Okay, having said all this, let's go back to the text and see whether maybe it doesn't seem as weird and fairy taley fairy tale like as it was before. All right, so there are bodhisattvas on the first ground. We already heard what they're able to do. Then on the second ground, sorry, on the first ground, likewise, this wise one will enter and exit a hundred meditative absorptions. Oh, hundreds of them, so again, any different types. We don't even have one. They have different types. Doesn't specify what they are, but it's just a summary, really. Then it says a hundred world systems he can tremble and illuminate. So <laughs> um, actually this verse um, was also, this, the word that is used here for tremble um, was also used, I think it's in the eighth chapter of the text, the, the eighth verse of the first of the first chapter. I think it's the eighth verse, where it also says the Bodhisattva has the ability to shake or to, to you know, lead to the trembling of, of other world systems. And first on reading this, um, we don't need to go to this verse now. You can look it up on your own. But first I'm reading is it sounds like causes an earthquake almost. It's like, oh, these bodhisattvas causing earthquakes. <laughs> I, was, I was like, mm, that doesn't seem too good. Like it doesn't seem. But then I remember reading Tsongsa um, Kensei uh, Rinpoche's book, uh, his commentary on exactly, well, at least the eighth verse. I'm just quickly trying to find it um, in my notes. And he gave a really nice explanation. I think it's called introduction. Didn't I say introduction to the middle way? No, I can't find it now. Uh, oh, yes, there it is. No, yes, that, that's it. Okay, so I think it was page 53 that I found it on. Okay, so the various lower realms, the levels of ordinary beings are exhausted joyfully progressing from Bumi to Bumi. Uh, this is thought to be eighth. Sorry, it takes me a moment to find it. I thought it was 8.53, but maybe it wasn't. Um, I think anyway. it's six, the sixth verse, Geshe-ba. Is it the sixth verse? Okay, great, six verse. Now born into, oh yeah, and it's able to stir, stir a hundred worlds. Very good, thank you. Um, that is on page, uh, it doesn't have page numbers on it, does it? Oh yeah, 29, yes, 29. Uh, in my version, in, in, in the kind of app I use, it says 53, but it's actually 29. So yes, it's um, it's verse number six, where Chandakirti in the very first chapter talks about the qualities of a bodhisattva. And here the word is used, yes, able to stir a hundred worlds. And like I said, stir them like as in the form of an earthquake. No, but what what does Tsongsa Khen Sen Rinpoche says? Uh, he says, <laughs> able to stir. Yeah, the fourth line talks about his ability. Perhaps the word move or shake. That's really literally what it means. He stir or tremble or causes to them to tremble so it really means move or shake would be better than stir 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 every second he can move the world if he wants to he doesn't have to do it all the time but he has the ability consider someone like gorbachev for example when he became president of the ussr all the stock markets went up and so on somewhere somehow there was a feeling that the world was shaken 
all right so it's like not shaken physically shaken but like a presence that can really move people not in in a negative way i mean if you're, well here's a positive way the stock, <laughs> stock markets went up right uh, well whatever you consider that be positive or negative but anyway what i'm trying to say is here to steer or to go back to the verse we're reading through right now which is in this in the 11th chapter verse 2 it's the same word uh, here like this move or shake and maybe we could really say it's like moving sentient beings really make a difference to these sentient beings knowing of uh, the existence of this bodhisattva okay then it goes on to say and illuminate illuminate and again not physically as much as kind of the light is often used to illuminate the darkness of ignorance the darkness of fear and so forth so illumination like doesn't have to be physical, but can just lighten the hearts of sentient beings, um, illuminate the hearts of sentient beings, the minds of sentient beings. And then goes on to say, through his supernatural feats, he can ripen a hundred beings to maturity, really ripen them to be able to practice the Dharma with the karmic connection that the Bodhisattva has on that level, can do that. He will journey to a hundred Buddha fields, can just easily communicate with these Buddha realms, Buddha fields or pure realms, if you like. So it can easily, um, yeah, receive teachings in different realms and different existences. And this offspring of the sovereign sage will open a hundred Dharma doors. So different Dharma teachings, different lineages possibly. And within his body, he will display, oh, there is, no, it does say a hundred other forms. So there'll be other forms that the Bodhisattva displays. Those hundred Bodhisattva forms thus display will each match his beauty, wealth, and retinue. So have these emanations, which again is really difficult to grasp. The idea of an emanation, is that like lots of puppets, like being kind of controlled by the same, well, never mind, don't go into too many. It's just one of those things, it's really hard to understand because our mind right now doesn't have the capacity. It just doesn't have the capacity. We're a bit like a, a blind person, right? trying to understand what blue is like, okay? Our mind just doesn't have, if you're, if you're blind, so your mind can't see, your mental consciousness, of course, is affected by what you can see or not, right? And then trying to understand what the color blue is, okay? It feels a bit like that, oh, the sun is actually, never mind, it'll go away at some point. It's that time of year. Okay, so anyway, um, what I'm just trying to say is, Therefore, um, it's, it's hard to really grasp this. So let's use our mind as much as we can, and it'll, it'll become more flexible. Of course, we're also thinking of these, these different ideas that are very difficult to grasp. First of all, we shouldn't be surprised that they're difficult, that it's just our mind doesn't have the capacity to really grasp them. But of course, our mind is, and here is where science tells us because of... Um, brain neuroplasticity because of neuroplasticity just as there's neuroplasticity well there's our mental plasticity our mind can get used to these ideas you know right you think about them often enough and at some point it go, you, you feel like yeah that makes sense it does make sense um, that there are these possibilities and one thing that has helped me for a while so I just want to share that with you how come we have that very limited sense of what is possible? Very limited sense. Our mind is so limited. That's one description that comes to mind. Our mind is extremely limited in its capacity. We can see very little. But it kind of makes sense that our mind is like that because it has been limited to I all this time, right? We've only been looking here, me. Just me, 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 me. And I don't know, you may know people who are even more self-centered than we are. I mean, for us, it's a little bit easier to notice people when their self-centeredness is, is more extreme than our own. If they're kind of on our level, it's difficult to recognize because they're kind of like us. But if there are, um, or sometimes we can recognize them because we recognize ourselves. But the point is like when people are even more self-centered than we are have you noticed that their sense of reality is very skewed 
very confused. They feel like they have the sense of everyone is talking about me. You know, maybe this person uh, didn't say hello because they don't like me. It's, it's like a sense it's all revolving around me. Okay. So in that case, we, we notice that they're not very perceptive of what's going on. They don't realize the other person is just having a bad day because we're just like, it's about me, 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 me. So that kind of idea, that kind of working on the mind, well, it's like that for us too, right? Not to this extreme. I mean, well, it's still an extreme in comparison to a Buddha's mind. Um, in, in a different way, we're just not aware of it. We don't perceive other beings around us, the possibilities. We believe everyone is just like me, should be like me, and that there's someone who has these incredible abilities. It's first really hard to believe. I'm saying it first. We get used to it, right? If, if you've been doing this long enough, um, heard about this long enough, you you consider that a possibility. But on the first hearing it, it seems like love fairy tale kind of stuff. But it makes perfect sense. If someone can remove their these these the sense of I, 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 they become a lot more perceptive of what's going on around them. Their mind is definitely in terms of the things that go on around this person. And when the mental possibilities open up, the physical possibilities open up as well, certain restrictions, right? I mean, people oftentimes when they're very close-minded, they're they're, they're stiffer. There's a stiffness that goes along, even this, a physical stiffness, just I, me, and mine, you know, they're not as flexible, even mental, I mean, physically, in general, I'm saying in general. So this kind of mental and physical kind of opening up, which then manifests in a way that they can manifest other beings, not just have to be one person, just me, 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 I can only be me, 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 and that's hard enough. So about opening their mind and manifesting whenever it's wherever it's 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 helpful right be different people at the same time and not talking about multiple personality disorders you know <laughs> not in that way of course no but just be appear in different forms right so we need to play with this a little bit and become more flexible in terms of understanding why we are the way we are and then based on that understanding the possibilities all right, so anyway, that's verse number three. And now the next verses, all I can do is really read through them. What's the time now? Oh, it's, yeah, it's seven, we're sure good. Read through them because now what the author does is really saying, well, on the next ground, from the second to the seventh ground, we just talked about the first ground, which you achieve once you achieve the path of seeing. So using numbers somehow to explain qualities that are beyond numbers, but just saying over oh, a hundred, that's not literally really a hundred, it's just saying a lot. Um, so really a hundred is like of all the ones that are a lot, it's the least of the many, right? It's like when you want to describe something like a many, that is not a few, but many, you say a hundred, a hundred deities of Toshita. Now, don't worry, it's not like literally a hundred deities, like, you know, just a hundred. It just means a lot. So it's kind of like the lowest of many, if you like, right? So it's, they don't really, they may say 10, they may say 50 are saying many, but it seems like a hundred is more like the, the first step of many. And then you just multiply it, right? Then you have a thousand and 10,000. And so this is how this is really put forth, like multiplying then these qualities. Okay. So if you, Look at verse four. It says, The wise one on perfect joy, having attained such qualities, so perfect joy is the first ground, attains the state the same on the next ground, the stainless, but increased a thousandfold. Okay, so increased a thousandfold, so multiplied by a thousand. And on the next five grounds, these qualities expand. So the qualities we went through, being able to perceive this and that and emanate different forms and what have you different absorptions all that is then multiplied here it says a thousand fold so really it's just saying not literally like taking out the calculator and it's like well what are the qualities no no it's more about getting a sense even more and even more these qualities just expand so on each level so on the next five grounds these qualities expand then increasing a thousand fold on the next 
next 100 million, then 10 billion. So up to the seventh. Why the seventh? Didn't I say the seventh? Yes. So 10 to 7 of the same, let's increase the thousand. The next five round, these qualities expand. Yeah. So the next, so the first and the second, and then on the next five, that's up to the seventh. Why seventh? Because the seventh ground is still a ground where a bodhisattva has afflictions. It's so only on the eighth ground that a bodhisattva eliminates all the afflictions. It's still left with the obscurations to enlightenment, but has eliminated the obscurations to liberation. So that's a huge step. Therefore, here, first, what's mentioned are the qualities all the way up to the last ground on which a bodhisattva has not yet attained liberation. And so all that Shantakirti is saying really is these qualities increase more and more. So they inc his qualities increase faster. Uh, where does it say? Uh, his qualities are increasing a thousandfold on the next and next 100 million um, next uh, thousand for the next five then on the next five ground these qualities expand his qualities increase faster a hundred thousand then increasing a thousand fold on the next next a hundred million then ten billion then one trillion and after this ten million trillion <laughs> i don't know i get lost <laughs> i get lost um yeah so it's like this whole system of numbers is very complicated anyway and, and then making it also very complicated when you have the tibetan terminology to it when sometimes the words are translated slightly differently. So anyway, never mind. I don't want to go into this, but it's a lot, a lot of qualities. Okay, that's all it's trying to say. So I don't want to kind of uh, talk about it in a kind of ridiculous way. No, it's just that's the only way you can really express it unless you have an alternative. How would you describe these incredible qualities? Okay, so that's up to verse five. Um, and now the qualities of the three pure grounds. So when a bodhisattva has, and I think I mentioned that before, so the first seven grounds, the qualities of which have been described with these numbers, um, they are called the impure grounds in that the afflictions are still present. But then with the last three grounds, they're described as the three pure grounds because now free from afflictions, not pure in the sense of having uh, eliminated the obscurations to enlightenment or the cognitive obscurations, but pure in the sense of having eliminated afflictive obscurations, that is, uh, obscurations to liberation. And so from that onwards, it says that they're no longer described in terms of numbers, but in comparable to the counts of subtle atoms. So if you use the Tibetan um, equivalent to like an atom, the Tibetans didn't no, not the Tibetan. I mean, I should be also the Sanskrit or the Tibetan. I mean, of course, not just the Tibetan, but here it's the Tibetan word that was translated from the Tibetan. But in general, the idea of an atom existed in India, existed in Tibet, but of course not explained in the same way with the nucleus and, and neurons and electrons and so forth. That explanation didn't exist, but just as like the smallest building blocks. Okay. So the one on the immovable ground, that's the eighth ground, who's free of concepts, attains such a magnitude, right? So on the eighth ground, the immovable, who's devoid of conceptualization of self-grasping. So having eliminated the subtlest type of self-grasping. So all the, the bodhisattvas left with is the imprints, but these imprints are strong. They've been left there for, well, since beginning this time. And so they're still restricting the mind of a bodhisattva so that the mind of a bodhisattva on the eighth ground is pretty close to the mind of a Buddha, but still not equal to the mind of a Buddha. There are still obscurations on the mind, and therefore the mind is still limited. Limited definitely through, well, lim limited in one way because phenomena still appear to exist inherently. That appearance has not gone away. And of course, the Bodhisattva is not able, this being on the eighth ground, is not able to perceive all phenomena simultaneously. And in that way, know exactly how to guide others according to their predisposition, their interests, their uh, inclinations, and so forth, guiding them towards full enlightenment. So it's still an obstruction that needs to be dealt with. But anyway... Definitely self-grasping is gone. Any type of self-grasping is gone. 
And this person on the eighth ground attains such a magnitude of qualities, they equal the number of atoms which exist in a hundred thousand billion fold worlds. Okay, so in all three realms of the entire, uh, well, hundred thousand billion worlds, it's called a, I don't know when I pronounce it correctly, tricleocosm, tricleocosm, I guess you could say. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not really sure about the mathematics. I've ex have had it explained um, different ways, but I had this, I have the sense it's one trillion. Uh, it's like a thousand uh, multiplied by a thousand by a thousand. That's kind of like the impression I got that it's one trillion. So the one trillion world systems. And again, it's not an exact number. Of course, it's just this incredibly high number. So here, what it's saying that the Bodhisattva has therefore attained qualities that equal the atoms of all the, yes, of all the world systems. So that's for the Bodhisattva on the eighth ground. Now the Bodhisattva who's residing on the next ground, the ninth ground, on which is called perfect intellect, attains these 12 qualities that were described before in verses one to three of the 11th chapter. Well, these qualities increase to the count of all the atoms in the 10 times 100,000 countless worlds. So 1 million of these countless cosms, whatever, right? I mean, these incredibly, uh, yeah, incredibly many world systems of the three realms, so multiplied 100 million. And then on the 10th ground, these qualities are such, uh, these 12 qualities, they lie beyond, beyond the bounds of speech. So our speech is too limited to even express them, although even previously it seemed that way. So such a total is the countless qualities indeed uh, that Bodhisattva attains. They equal the count of all atoms that exists in the Buddha fields, even beyond what is inexpressible. So, and it's the phrase to say the least indicates that of the qualities on the 10th ground, they're not yet exhausted by even what we said. It's just so beyond. Um, and what, what is more on such a level, such a bodhisattva on the 10th ground can, um, without making an effort, without any conscious intention, display within every bodily pore, countless, so body pore, we have, thousands of them um, display countless bodhisattvas kind of display whatever is needed for sentient beings benefit so really what this is saying they can manifest in many different ways similar to a buddha but still not equal to a buddha but still it's saying the message behind this really or what is really um implying that is that it's like on each level your qualities increase so incredibly. So it's not just you go from an ordinary person to be a Buddha suddenly. No. And here we're talking about the sutric path, you know, but even like even the tantric path, you go through these different stages just much quicker because the goal is Buddhahood. But even if you go in a slower fashion, in a slower, uh, um, in a slower way, you attain these incredible qualities and can do so much benefit. You can benefit sentient beings um so greatly and that's the whole purpose so what should inspire us is well first of all the ability that we can do all this however you know however unlikely this may seem considering our state right now okay that's the first kind of uh hurdle we have to overcome a sense this is totally impossible but then when we get a sense this is possible, understand that these qualities will increase to such an extent that from then on, once we, well, enter the Mayana path, of course, and then move through the path and stages, we can do so much for the benefit of sentient beings. So it's really rising and, and, and expanding these qualities we have, and uh, we can do so much. And there are endless sentient beings and endless world systems, and we can be there, not just, I mean, right now we can't even help ourselves or the people around us but slowly we can help the people around us people in this world we can have potentially at least i mean of course from their side they need to be open and ready to be helped but from our side we have that ability and then further and further and further we can benefit more and more beings 
um, just being actually just one person, but manifesting different forms until that culminates in achieving the state of a Buddha, of course, and then there really is no limit. Um, so this is all we can do from our side. Of course, sentient beings need to be ready, need to be, uh, but at least whoever is ready, we are ready from our own side and we can still affect them in ways in which they not, may not even be aware of. Um, yeah, so this is why all this is mentioned, just to inspire us. There's not much explanation I can give here. I didn't find much in, in the commentaries either. But yeah, like I said, I think Chandra Kitty's purpose of this is just to, to, to give us a sense of the possibilities and inspire us to practice, um, well, according to his instructions and the instructions of the Buddha. Anyway, I'll continue just with this the last verses here before we go until verse 10 we won't be able to go into today but then nine finish that so such a bodhisattva displays well within every poor countless buddhas with bodhisattvas um with a retinue of incalculable incalculable bodhisattvas where are we oh yeah together with bodhisattvas and likewise, in every pore of this body, it can display within every single instant other forms as well, namely those of the beings of five realms of existence, celestial beings, demigods, humans, and so on. So not just Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, but also ordinary beings that appear as ordinary beings uh, to benefit others. All right. Anyway. Okay. So you see in the end, it just go a little bit faster. And next time we'll start, let me just check the time. Oh yeah, we're good with time. So um, just to kind of briefly summarize, well, I started off talking about the fact that um, right now we have a very limited sense of what we're capable of doing and what others are capable of doing just because we don't know any different, our mind is not used to think along these, these well, in, in, in those ways. And of course, I've also gave some brief explanation on why I thought this was the way, the reason being so self-centered and being busy around, well, just being concerned with our self and our own world, our own being, and that it's possible to expand the mind, of course, first of all, by reducing our self-centeredness, focusing more on love and compassion, uh, but also to, to just kind of reflect on the different possibilities of the very little that we perceive and that there actually is just taking the scientific understanding of different galaxies, the, the, the size of the universe in comparison to the size of our world. And of course, on top of the different worlds that, that, that exists uh, that we just cannot perceive, there are other levels of existence we just cannot perceive simply because we lack the sense faculties because that's all we have to actually be able to perceive something outside of ourselves so we're lacking that anyway that accounts for then the possibility of course or that explains the possibility of um, other realms especially pure realms where bodhisattvas live uh, exist that we just cannot perceive and even if they existed around us we wouldn't be able to perceive this unless we had the karma to perceive them and having these incredible qualities that we just went through so to get a sense that they expand they get greater and greater and greater and then of course culminate culminate in buddhahood okay so let's meditate on that that was a lot uh, for today but yeah Hopefully we can, in a few minutes, internalize that to be really, to, to not just see it as something over there, like an intellectual idea, but something that may actually, uh, well, affect us emotionally. And that's just the first step anyway. Okay, so I'll turn to do some reflection. And as, as usual, we start um, with some breathing meditation.
So in order to inspire us, to encourage us, and to cause in us the aspiration to follow the Bodhisattva path, we should reflect on the incredible qualities bodhisattvas attain once they realize emptiness directly. And therefore reach the different grounds This we can, of course, only do if we let go of the notion that things can only exist the way they appear to us right now. So even though it may seem to us there are no other beings who have the qualities that are described here, let's take a moment to consider the fact that so many other forms of existence and different world systems, different galaxies for one. Also in different realms of existence that right now we and the other people we know simply cannot perceive. Or at least we think others don't perceive them. What does Chandakirti tell us? That once we enter the Bodhisattva path, by generating Bodhicitta, spontaneously arising bodhicitta. And having first conceptually realized emptiness. That brought our conceptual understanding together with a deep level of concentration. A form of a union of calm abiding and special insight. We 
you will eventually realize emptiness directly. and thereby attain the first Bhumi, the first ground. Where we can encounter at least a hundred Buddhas have an extremely long life. Perceive events in the past that are long gone. And many events there lie in the future. We can enter many different types of meditative absorptions. Move many different world systems. develop supernatural abilities. Manifest many different forms. And so forth for the benefit of other sentient beings. That is just the beginning. Once we have realized emptiness directly. With less and less effort be able to move through the the other grounds where are these 12 qualities chandrakirti mentions plus many many more or multiply Further and further. As we proceed through the boomies, the grounds. Benefiting the beings around us, those in other world systems, and even those in other realms that physically exist in the same place but that ordinary humans cannot perceive. Haven't even, haven't even 
reach the last levels before Buddhahood and still there's so much Bodhisattvas can do without having eliminated afflictive obscurations. That is while still on the seven impure grounds. And then think, once you've attained those impure grounds and eventually eliminate all self-grasping, that is you reach the first of the pure grounds, the eighth ground. Your qualities can no longer be expressed in numbers. But rather, in terms of being comparable to the counts of atoms, in all of samsara. And it's on the ninth and then eventually on the eleventh ground the equalities will be the closest to the ones of a Buddha yet still not be the same So therefore think all that, all these qualities can be achieved as a bodhisattva. How amazing it will be to become fully enlightened. Be of such measurable benefit to all sentient beings. At least having the potential to lead all of them with the same enlightened state.
So now to conclude this short analysis, spend a few moments single-pointedly focusing on whatever conclusion you've come to, to further internalize it. Based on that analysis, this analytical meditation, spend a moment to deepen your determination to attain exactly that enlightened state with its immeasurable qualities for the benefit of all the sentient beings. out of deep love and concern for every living being. And then let's dedicate all the virtue we've accumulated today towards the state of enlightenment when we ourselves will attain these endless qualities for the benefit of all sentient beings. So may our merit become a cause for us to reach such a state. But since we can't reach it without the assistance of our kind lamas, let's dedicate our virtue likewise towards the extremely long and healthy life of our kind spiritual masters like his homeless, the Dalai Lama, and so forth. that may continue to inspire and guide us. And may, of course, our virtue affect the people around us in this world and all the other world systems and realms. May those who are sick, like Tali Lubin, like Geshe Putzok and Tali Lubin, quickly recover. May all the armored conflicts be over as soon as possible. And of course, may our merit affect the world the way Shantideva says in his prayer. May all beings everywhere plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing the hungry find food, may the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all of us sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power 
It made people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. All right, thank you very much. Uh, please don't forget this week for this week of the six axioms, the six, the, sorry, the four axioms of the four seals. Your focus is on all phenomena being empty and selfless and of that empty here in the sense that there is no permanent, partless, independent self. And bring this together, of course, with bodhicitta, hopefully through what we've been doing through the last few month and in particular well the last few classes uh, the qualities of a bodhisattva how incredible they are getting us a better sense of the incredible qualities of a buddha and then of course inspiring us to aim towards that state for the benefit of all sentient beings so to alternate between that and of course the method aspect and the understanding of reality in particular the fact that there's no permanent practice independent self all right, so have a great week. Be well, and I'll see you again next week. Okay. Thank you, Kishima. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Oh, happy Mother's Day <laughs> to all the mothers out there. <laughs> okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Dharma friends. Bye. Bye. Thank you.